So, my question uh, is about uh, parenting, the controlling uh, parenting, which is an abusive one, tend to break down uh, kids, children, in uh, the attempt of the parents to make the best out of them. And uh, uh, to me, it seems a fella, uh, uh, mistake. Um, and I was, I was wondering why the system allows it in certain cases. I mean, I can agree, I could agree that maybe some consciousness, new consciousness, comes to tests uh, in their families, confronting difficult situations and so on. But there are also these situations when new consciousness came in little baby, uh, so in babies, and <clears throat> they have this wonderful creation, creative impulse, impulse, and so these wonderful thinking patterns, and they are brilliant. But their parents control them in such ways and uh, torture them actually, and they become not what they were supposed to be at, or the, what they could have been at their beginning. And this to me seems uh, a failure from the system. I mean, I'm not sure is there, uh, if this is always a test, or is something else, or actually randomness, or what is it then? Okay. I hear a similar sort of question a lot, and that usually starts out with, how could the system allow this to happen? Okay. Innocent little babies being born into a world where parents, though they're well-meaning, twist them to make them neurotic and unhappy so that then they become neurotic, happy, unhappy adults that twist their own children and so on it goes. Well, the answer to that is that the uh, system does not force its will onto what happens here. Everyone has free will and they can do as they choose. The system doesn't allow or not allow. It just lets us be who we are and what we do. That innocent child that comes in and then gets warped, that innocent child was a parent that was very restrictive and warped his children when, uh, when he was here and was a parent. He did those things as well. And then he comes back again as the child, and now he sees the other side of that. And then he grows up and probably does the same things to his children. And then he comes back here again, and he gets to experience that being done to him. And so on it goes until we grow up. That's part of the feedback that we have, is that we have to live in a world of our own creation. As long as we have they make poor choices, we're going to create a world that's dysfunctional. And lifetime after lifetime, we hopefully eventually grow up and get better and stop doing those things. But the consequences of our bad behavior tends to be to perpetuate bad behavior. But slowly, we outgrow the bad behavior. So it's not that the system shouldn't allow poor little babies to come into such a horrible place. You know, why are people born in places where they only have an expectancy to live till they're six years old before they starve to death? Well, the system doesn't allow it or disallow it. It's what we have created here. It's the situations we create. We could prevent that. We, humanity, could see to it that that didn't happen. We could share the things we have. We could have different attitudes but we don't. We let that, that happen. It doesn't have to necessarily, but we let it. So it's a, it, it's a representative of us and our quality. So that's what's going on. That little innocent child is not really so innocent in that it was a person probably doing much the same thing. But the fact that you get to see both sides of it as the child and the parent makes it easier for you to learn. You're getting a bigger perspective. So first of all, the, so the system does not come in and make things happen or allow or disallow things. We can be just as, as dysfunctional as we wish. But as we get more and more dysfunctional, we create more and more pain in this world. And that pain is a, is a learning tool. When you're doing things that cause you pain, you should start thinking about what you should do differently. You know, 
where is that pain coming from? So it's part of our, it's part of who we are, and it's our lesson. And we all are in this together. We all are trying to grow up together. So it's not a, an unfair thing to the child. That child is just part of this thing that we are, this planet, you know, this species. It's just a part of that. And it gets the, it has to deal with what we create, just as we do. Stuff happens, you get to deal with it. Right now, the relative, or the, the average quality of consciousness is pretty low. Hopefully that'll change. But certainly it will change in time. Hopefully it'll change sooner instead of later. But there's a lot of horrible things in this world. And the system doesn't let them happen, or make them happen. It uh, lets us create our own environment because that environment's our feedback. I have two uh, other remarks. So you say on, on one, one side that actually, let me try to so say, place in your own family or a difficult family, let's say, uh, so what owns it or has to do deal with it. And uh, anyway, I'm not with the innocent or not innocent child. Uh, my focus was, for the focus of the question was, um, isn't that a bit off for the system? Because the system tends to evolve and so it would be a better choice to place those good consciousness in a better suitable family, so to say. Yeah, if there are enough better suitable families. You know, there's children just popping out all over and every time you have a child, then some, some uh, consciousness is going to have to play that avatar. Now, it could be you know, played two ways. You could say that uh, you let an individuated unit of consciousness play the children that have nicer environments and families and things and let uh, the larger conscious system play all the ones that are terrible. <laughs> you know? They're all NPCs. You, know, you could say something you know, that that would maybe be a way to go. But you've got seven and a half billion of us, and whether people are in terrible circumstances, great circumstances, whether they're mentally healthy or neurotic, they still have babies. They keep on having babies. And as they do, then consciousness has to play those parts, whether it's the LCS or whether it's an IUOC. Some consciousness has to play that part. Okay, now, perhaps the system could play all the ugly parts itself, but part of life and growing up is also dealing with the ugly parts. In the beginning, a, a person, a consciousness, just needs experience. And some of that experience could be easy and fun, some of that experience could be very painful. <clears throat> it needs experience. And the more it experiences the whole thing, I think the better able it is to grow. We grow from pain as well as grow from pleasure. <coughs> so does that help? <coughs> Isn't there some kind of like minimum responsibility of the process? Um, hmm? um, so, so, I mean, for me, it's a bit like you have a kid <coughs> Mm -hmm. place them in a kindergarten environment, so far so good. <coughs> so we can't do too much damage in this environment. But it's a bit like then you hand out knives, razors, and hand grenades to those kind of children and you say like, okay, blow each other up, it's your own fault because you weren't involved enough. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, shouldn't be at least there some, some bottom line where you say, okay... Mm. Well, if you've handed fun. out knives and weapons to those children, that would be a big problem. But if those children develop those weapons on their own, then that's the consequences of their own choices. Might it also be correct to see the fundamental <coughs> process at work in, in that particular scenario is what, what's being discussed? You know, children born into bad circumstances, etc. Um, since the fundamental process itself is so fundamental to everything that is it also at play 
in essentially how we develop as human beings and, and how societies develop and how you know kids either survive or don't or people survive or don't. Sure. Survive it's all evolution. It's all evolution. Survive. It's, it's all evolution. We, vent, we eventually learn from our mistakes. You know, we make mistakes and we learn from them. The things that work go forward. The things that don't work are self-destructive. The negative side of things is self-destructive. That's one of the really good things. Negativity destroys itself. Positive reinforces itself. So in as much as you have negative things, those negative things create its own destruction. In other words, the negative stuff is self-eliminating. But it has to go through the motions of that self-eliminating, be self-eliminating. Like you have the, you know, the warlord, right? The warlord mentality is an unstable system. It'll never be a stable system. It's a, you know, it's a system of control and force. Control and force isn't the right way to approach things. So that will always self-destruct. How many, you know, or how often do, you know, violent, uh, nasty dictators, how long do they generally last? You know, what's the lifespan of a nasty dictator? Generally not all that long. It's self-destruct, you know, it self-destructs. When you create that kind of negativity, then you're in a system that that um, is constantly tearing itself apart. But you get a piece of that system that's positive and it's working, that will build. Well, the negative can come in and tear that up too, but it'll rebuild. It'll keep working. And eventually it will dominate. But it takes a while for that to happen. So we're still in the early throes of our evolution, of our consciousness. So we have a lot of negative stuff to deal with, but it is just part of our evolution. That is correct. And you don't know what does work until you try it and see. And then if you find out it works, well then it tends to build on itself. If it doesn't work, it tends to destroy itself. That's why, you know, you've probably heard me say that the positive growth, positive potential, has so much more headroom to grow. The negative tops out. That's because it's self-destructive. So you can have negative entities, negative beings, negative people, and they can gain power, but they can't hold that power for so long. And the results of that power start to disintegrate. It doesn't last. So the negative side keeps boiling up and boiling up and it gets about so powerful and it crumbles and it boils back up and it crumbles and it can't just keep building. Whereas the positive can just keep building on that positive. It's stable. Fascism is a, totalitarianism is an unstable system. It'll never work. You'll never have a, a totalitarian system that will persist and go on and on and on and on. It won't. It's an unstable system. It'll always self-destruct. And the, the opposite of that, things that do work, things that are caring, they can be destroyed by totalitarianism, but they'll keep on regenerating and they'll keep on chucking and eventually that will dominate as we grow up. So that's kind of the good news, is that the negative side is limited in to how far it can go. Now I've been in some reality systems that were really horrible, that were terribly negative. And I think you can get to a point where the negative dominates everything, it self-destructs, it gets down to a very basic level where it's back to the law of the jungle, right? You can take anything that you're big enough to take and strong enough to hold, and then it's yours. You get that level of, of interaction but in that, even at that level, there are other groups. There are, what do we call them, um, you know, 
counterculture of the positive that's starting to grow. So even if you let that along, even if you take one that's totally dominated by negativity, that the quality of consciousness is near zero, and it's widespread, anything that's, that's good's been killed or wiped out or whatever, and you just let that sit there and fester, eventually positive things will start to grow out of it, and they'll start to build, because all this negative stuff, everybody's so miserable. Then you see this little bit of positive stuff over there, and you, know, you want to leave here and go join that, because that's positive. Eventually that grows up, and eventually that will win. But it takes time. And it doesn't mean that you always move steps forward. Sometimes you can move a bunch of steps backward before you go forward again. But evolution is such that it's always working toward lower entropy. It's always working toward more efficient. And the negative things, the totalitarian things, are not efficient. They're self-destructive. So in the long run, you can see we will get there. We will end up in that space of most of us are grown up and have very high quality of consciousness. It's inevitable that we will get there. How long will it take is a variable that, you know, that we don't know. But for the first time in the history of humanity, we have a shot at it in the next, maybe the rest of the century, you know, next decade or two or four or ten, who knows, but we have a shot at it haven't had that opportunity before in the human race because we haven't been together like we are now because of internet and other communication kind of makes us, you know, it makes the world shrink in mind space, in connection space, in intuitive space. The world's shrinking and shrinking towards getting down to the size of a tribe. And eventually we will, we will succeed. But meanwhile, we have to put up with our own bad behavior because that bad behavior is what teaches us that good behavior is better. So as hard as it is and as ugly as it can get, it's just part of the process of evolving to a better state that we will one day get there. That's the thing, the good thing about evolution. Evolution just keeps chugging. It's relentless. Evolution doesn't throw up its hands and say, all right, I quit. You guys are just too dumb for me to work with you anymore. You know, evolution never gets to that point. Evolution just says, well, whatever level we're at, what works will continue and what doesn't work will go away. Well, the negative stuff doesn't work. It doesn't have long-term viability. It just isn't uh, functional. So eventually, that evolution will chug its way to a point that keeps lowering the entropy and lowering your entropy, even if we backslide. Even if, as Rooney fears, you know, the environment gives out and global warming, you know, kills a lot of people and the rest of that, you know, okay, that might happen, that nuclear winter idea, you know, that could have happened. Well, if it does, then we'll just keep on chugging the best we can with what we got. And if there's only, you know, a, a million out of a out of seven and a half billion of us left, well, then that's what we got left to work with. Who knows? Or maybe the species and a lot of other species are all wiped out together. Well, we may have to wait until fish learn to walk again. You know? But it just keeps chugging. Now, from the larger consciousness system's viewpoint, it's got a learning lab here that it would like to be serving the purpose of helping consciousness evolve. If we're back to the fish learning to walk again, then we're not being all that productive because there's not a lot of real good choices being made there. The choices are not that profitable choices for the system. So the system has a, a, a reason to try to not let that go that bad, get that bad, or happen like that. There's no reason to think that the system wouldn't come in and tweak a little bit here and tweak a little bit there and nudge some things like we were talking about it at lunch. We have so many things happening now that are shaking people out of their kind of materialist coma. The world's a bigger place. Look at all the strange stuff that's going on. 
opening minds to something different, something new, something bigger, something more than just us. These minds are being popped open all over. Well, I think that's the system trying to prepare us for opportunities that are coming. So the system isn't just sitting back and saying, hey, you guys are on your own, you know. Make it or lose it, whatever. I don't have a dog in this fight. It does have a dog in the fight. It wants us to succeed. Our success is its success. It wants us to be a viable entropy reduction trainer for individual agents of consciousness. So it will try to manage that, but it will not make choices for us. If we want to make a bad choice, we have free will. If we want to make good choices, we have free will. So it will never come down and say, oh, you're the bad people, stop doing that. It will let us do whatever we do, create whatever we create, but it can try to push or nudge outside of actually overriding our free will. It won't do that. So we're, we're all in this together, the babies and the adults. You know, you're an adult for a while, and then you're a baby for a while, and then you're an adult for a while. We're all kind of in this thing together, and we're all creating it. The average level of quality is generally low. But this was the example. Of, I mean, uh, this is a counter counter example because in this situation, the family, the the, the parents don't evolve. They also at 17 years, 70 years old. They they are the same. And maybe the kid has not uh, saved his, uh, himself from the <laughs> bad situation. I mean, it's like a downfall for everybody. Yeah, well, they, they will grow out of it. Eventually, some of those kids, some of those kids will outgrow that. All right, they had terrible parents, but they aren't going to be terrible when they become parents. And they remember all those things that their parents did to them, and they're not going to do that to their children. And they grow beyond it, and that happens. If it never happened, then there wouldn't be any evolution. We'd just be stuck here. But it does happen. And not only that, sometimes it happens in very dramatic ways. There was a young girl who wrote a book, don't remember the name, can't tell you, but her parents were drug addicts. Both of them were drug addicts. Meth, I think, or something like that. And she was the oldest, so when she was like 10 years old, she actually became the mother. She had to take care of the other, I think there was like three other siblings. So, as a 10-year-old, she had responsibility to make sure the diapers got changed on the baby and the rest of it because her parents were addicts and were totally irresponsible. And she pulled herself up out of that mess. She found ways to get an education. She ended up with a college degree, a PhD, <clears throat> and was a very successful person, yet she came out of a background that was likely to have been just deadly. It was abuse, poverty, I mean all the negatives that you could think of. And uh, kids do come out of it better. Kids do treat their own children better than they were treated. So we do grow. It's just slow. And I know it's disheartening and it's, it's uh, sad to see all the dysfunction, but it is who we are. But we do do better. It's not that we don't do better. It's just slower than we, than we think. You have a lot of, em of, a lot of uh, empathy, and you see these terrible things going on, and it's really hard just to watch them go on. And you think, how could that be? But it is the way we are. It's the choices that we make. But we are getting better. And I think in the most part, you would find that in those families, the kids do a little better than their parents. And their kids do a little better than they did. And so on, it, it, it works out. That's one of the reasons that somewhere, <clears throat> somewhere down the line, you know, we, we have to, this, this uh, avatar dies and we start with a new avatar. Because otherwise we would get stuck. Our growth would come, go to zero, and there we would be, 
nasty people forever. We wouldn't, you know, we'd get, we'd paint ourselves in a corner of our own beliefs and then we'd be done. And it would be really hard for us to grow past that point. So that's why the reincarnation is part of a necessity that we, we die, we come back, we get to do it again. We get to try. And if we weren't, we learned something the last time, then maybe we'll do it better this time. So it does work. Even though there's a lot of sad things going on, it's all part of this process of evolution. I see my, I'm not being very successful. I'm cheering you up. <laughs> That's maybe a subject to address too. I have any number of people contact me with this idea that this world is just so hard, I can't stand to live in it. All the ugliness and all the fear and all the stuff, I just can't stand to deal with it. You know, I want out. I can't live here. It's just too horrible. I, you know, if they watch TV, it makes them cry because they see all the horrible things going on. And the attitude you have to have is not that you're responsible for all of that and not that you have you may have empathy in general but you can't take all of that on to yourself you have to let those people be all those people and they're hurting each other I mean you have that in your family and most of us will have families and if you go back and look at your aunts and your uncles and your your siblings and your parents, and you can say, oh, I just see those people are just hurting themselves all the time. They're arguing with each other, they're fighting, they're, and it's so unnecessary. And you love those people. And it's so unnecessary how they're constantly hurting each other, fighting with each other, struggling with each other. These are people you love, but you have to let them be. You have to not look at it as, I can't fix them, and I can't stand it that I can't fix them. It's not your responsibility to fix them. You have to look at those people and say they are who they are. They're making their own choices. They're stuck in their own situations and they have to deal with it. And that's true even if they're children. And you have to let them be. They're on their own path, making their own choices, learning their own things. And as sad as that is, you just have to let them do what they do with the idea that perhaps the pain they're causing will help them do better next time. And if not, perhaps the pain they'll cause themselves next time will make them better. And eventually it will. Again, eventually people learn. This is slow. So this idea that the world's too ugly to live in is where you feel like you have to change it. And if you don't, you're a failure. I need to get my family, even if your family's humanity, I need to get my family to stop doing all this, and I can't. Therefore, I just can't stand it. Well, you're taking on too much. That's your, your ego it wants to solve everybody's problem. Wants to, I only want to live in a happy place. Well, if you don't live in a happy place, then you can't take everybody's choices personally. You can only fix yourself. You can't fix anybody else. And your responsibility is only for fixing yourself and doing the best you can for others where you can do good for them. And if you're a parent, then that gives you a good chance to do good in the world, to help those children grow up to be healthy and strong and full of positive attitudes. That's great. But if you're not a perfect parent, <laughs> kids come out with problems and twists and things, well, they'll just have to deal with that. You did the best you could with what you had to work with at the time, and after that, everybody has to deal with what comes, including your kids. You're not going to be a perfect parent. Sometimes you're going to be grumpy and you're going to, you're going to fuss at your kid and holler at him and browbeat him, and later you'll think, oh, that was just overdone. I shouldn't have done that, you know, but it's done. It probably happened to you. You probably had a parent fuss at you at a time when it really wasn't all that appropriate or 
accuse you of doing something you didn't do or whatever, and you just had to deal with it. That's part of what helps us grow up. So you don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is be the best that you can be for each choice. That's it. That's all you have. You have that responsibility. So here's something that happens. How am I going to deal with it in the most positive way possible? Well, you think about it, think about the consequences, think of who else it touches, who else it might hurt or help, and you make your best choice. After that, go on. The only reason for going backwards is to look at it later and say, was that a good choice? Or could I have made a better choice and learn from that? But don't feel guilty because you did it wrong. Guilt is just ego and self-pity. It won't help you get anywhere. Learn from your past, but don't feel guilty about it. Just keep doing the best you can. And if well, all you did in your life was just try to do the best you could, then you optimized your experience here. Even if you hurt a lot of people and left a trail of destruction in your wake, you optimized your experience here. <laughs> you did the best you could. <laughs> you see? So that's just the way it is. And you have to let people be who they are. You don't have to be perfect, but you got to try. Otherwise, if you have to be perfect, you know, we'd all be you know, ready to hang ourselves or something, you know, we, you don't have to be perfect. You never should feel guilty. You can feel sad. Love feels sad sometimes. Boy, I really screwed that up. That's good. That's a learning point. Learn from it so you don't screw it up next time. But every time you just have to say, whatever happens, good, bad, or indifferent, I'll, do, I'll deal with it with as much caring for others as I can. I'll learn from it. And then eventually, if we have that attitude, we'll all grow up, no matter how imperfect we are. So being perfect is not required. And that's your family, the people you love, that they hurt each other. It's just who they are. You accept it. The thing is, if you get pulled into it emotionally, then you become part of the problem. If you're in there trying to tell them, don't do that, don't act like that, you know, don't be so self-centered, no, don't tell her that, no, don't say those things, now you're just a part of it. You are now part of the dysfunction. <laughs> Even though you see yourself as trying to help to instruct them to be better. You can't instruct people to be better. You have to let them make those choices themselves. What you can do is give them an environment of safety, an environment of love, and that gives them their best opportunity to actually do better. When people feel threatened, they kind of react. They don't think. And as long as people are reactive, it's hard for them to make good decisions. If you give them that safe space, well, whatever you do, I'll still love you. you know, I still think you're a wonderful person, you know, even though you do these things and you hurt people and you go off and accuse people of things, whatever, you know, mom or child, whoever it is, I'll still love you anyway then that gives them a safe space to be in, with you anyway, that they can afford to not just be reactive. They can think a little more about what they're doing. So that's about all you can do for other people. But that's kind of the, where we are. So if you have, that's why I say with your children, the best thing you can do with them is give them a safe space in which they can grow up. That's the thing. And give them the rules so they I mean, rules are going to be in their life. Rules are everywhere. When, they, when you grow up and get a job, even if you were spoiled rotten as a kid and, and you, know, you had your parents stepping and fetching for you like slaves, when you grow up and have to deal with the rest of the world, it's not going to be like that. Sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with rules and other people, and otherwise the system will chew you up and spit you out. And if it doesn't happen in this lifetime, it'll happen in the next. So you might as well learn that there are rules. That this is a social situation. And in social situations, we have to cooperate. And in cooperating, we have to work together. And we do that not because we have to, but because we have responsibility and we care about other people. That's why we do it. Not because just the rule says it, it's because that's 
better way. And if you teach your kids that when they're three and four and five and six, then that makes them real easy when they're 14, 15, 16, and 17, if they already know that. But if you tell them what to do, that doesn't help them learn that. Because it's not their choice. It's their requirement. Mm -hmm. So given that we are conscious entities that were created in order to improve the quality of our consciousness, decrease our entropy, and hence the entropy of the entire system, uh, given that that's our mission, that's our goal, it seems to me that a recurring theme in trying to achieve that goal um, is the fear versus love theme. And it seems that the fear versus love uh, function can be used essentially as a barometer to gauge one's um, progress mm -hmm. in this journey uh, and, and to, to give us also some uh, instantaneous feedback within ourselves as we are progressing. Yeah, that's true. Can you please explain uh, more about the fear and the love and the definitions of them. Um, because there are various different definitions of fear and various different definitions of love. Um, so can you clarify uh, the exact you know, definition of the love that we should be seeking to become and the fear that we should be seeking to shed? Yes, but you can, as I quantify it, it probably won't shine the light on it that you're looking for. But I can define it rather precisely, even rather technically. And that is, those things, you know, it's like the uh, difference between good and bad. Good choices, bad choices. Choices on the side of love, choices on the side of fear. Good and bad good and evil can be defined rather rather uh, exactly by saying good is that which lowers entropy for the system and evil is that which raises entropy for the system it's just that simple so that's what makes when some things good and some things bad it's not about what you do. It's not even so much about the immediate, the immediate result of what you do. It's about the long-term system entropy that you affect. And if what you do lowers that, then it's, it's a good thing. If it raises that, then it's not a good thing. So that's kind of the the way you define, you know, good and bad, making choices. All right, so how does one measure the entropy? See, now if you want to, something that you can use, you have to have an entropy meter that tells you whether that's good or not. Well, there is no entropy meter other than what I mentioned yesterday about your feelings, your emotions. If your emotions are positive, Generally, you're doing well. You're making good choices. If your emotions are not, if they're negative, then you're not doing so well. So what is your life like? Do you do a lot of complaining? Do you see things negative? You, you know, you're unhappy. It's, oh, no. Look at the state of the world, uh, this and that. You know, if you're just feeling bad, negative, and those things, well, you need to grow some more. If you're generally happy and full of joy and life is great, then you're probably doing very well. So that's a good, if you want a yardstick, how am I doing, just look at your feelings. Um, but it's not just, like I say, it's not morality, right and wrong, it's not so much on what you do, it's a little more on the result of what you do, but even more on why you do it. So if you do something, with the right intention, then generally that works out well. That's more likely to lower entropy. If you do things with poor intention, then that 
usually doesn't work out so well. It creates problems for you and for others. For instance, uh, an example I use sometimes is if, uh, you know, if you're walking down the street and there's a person 10 feet ahead of you and a $20 bill falls out of their pocket and lands on the ground. Okay, and you now have a couple of choices. You can pick it up and stick it in your pocket and keep walking. You could call to them. And you can do that for different reasons. If you do, if you do uh, call to them and say, oh, you lost this and here's your $20 bill, you can do that for two separate reasons. One, because you think you should. Or two, because people are watching. <laughs> or three, because you... Uh, Come to hell if you don't do it. Huh? Maybe you come to hell if you don't do yeah, it. Yeah, right. so maybe you'll go to hell if you don't do it. Yeah. So if you, those are all wrong reasons. Because people are watching. You know, maybe people you know are watching. You know, so you give it back because that would be the right thing to do. Well, on the other hand, if you don't, if your intellect's not involved in it at all, somebody lost some money, oh, you know, you need to give it back to them. It's just the way you are. You're honest at the bean level, not at the intellectual level. So honest at the intellectual level really isn't honest at all. It's fear. You don't want to get caught. Or you don't want to go to hell. Or whatever. You see. So that's not a good decision. So one of them is a moral decision, which is just being honest because you are. The others are not moral decisions. You're acting honest because you have fear. And there's a big difference. So the, the, the very same actions can be moral or immoral. So it's not the action that carries immorality. It's the intent behind it. So we don't make, you know, so our choices. If we really have done what I just said earlier, you make the best choice you can for the lowest entropy, long-term solution. You do the best you can with others in mind more than yourself. Yourself can be in mind, but you need to have others in mind too. How is this going to affect other people? It's going to affect me. It's going to affect these other people. They're going to affect other people. What's, the, what's going to be the long-term result of this choice? If you always make that choice with the idea of the lowest entropy in the system, which means how it affects everybody, then that is your moral choice. Even if that moral choice means that you have to take a club and bash somebody in the head because that person has been going around murdering everybody and you, you need to stop them. You see, it's not always the choice of, of love and peace. Well, it may be love, but not necessarily peace. This is not a pacifist philosophy. It's a philosophy of minimizing entropy in the system long term. So there's some things you need to stop in, you know, you need to step in and stop it. You see somebody, you know, see a bigger kid kicking a smaller kid. You don't say, oh, it's life, it's the way we are, and walk on. You have a responsibility to intervene. Because to not intervene is not helpful. Because you think that that's going to be the lower entropy solution, not to have this <coughs> kid beaten up. Well, you may or may not be right. Maybe that little kid deserved it. Maybe that little kid just, you know, did something horrible to that kid and that was his, his whatever. You know, that was his, his um, consequences. You don't know that. You have to make the best call you can based on what you think at the time. And if you do that, you'll grow. So the, the point is, you don't always have to be right. And if you think, well, how do I know I'm making a good choice? How do I know breaking up that fight was a good thing to do? How do I know whatever? You don't. You don't know for the most part. You just have to use your intuition, make the best choice you can, do it, and then learn from it. If it turns out that was a bad choice, you say, ah, where did I go wrong? Well, I didn't find out enough about what was going on there first before I stepped in and took action. I should have just pulled those two kids apart and figured out what was going on first before I, you know, walked off. So then you'll learn something. So that's how we grow. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to do it right. We 
just have to do the best we can. And then we let the chips fall where they may. So that's the, th you know, you, so you don't really need a meter, you know, an entropy meter so much as you do just have to work from wherever you are. Would it be correct, in, in, in hearing your, your answer, um, it occurred to me that maybe the definition of love in, in this context is essentially acting or taking action uh, with the intent to benefit others and, do, and having that come from your being level. Yeah. Then that's, that's would be defined as doing the best you can. That's you trying to optimize your behavior. That's doing the best you can. And that will optimize your learning. You'll grow up fastest if you can have that attitude. And is that love? Is, is that love is... Attitude? That is expressing love to the, to the capacity to which you can express it. Right. That is as much as you can express that. It's caring about others. Others are important. You might get to a situation and say, this is... This is lower entropy for me, but it's really high entropy for all these other people. Well, that's not a good decision then, because for all those other people, you're the sum, you know, if you sum over all of that, the system actually, you know, increases entropy. It's not a good thing. So you have to consider yourself in it. That's fair enough. But you have to consider others. What does the most good for the most people? So since we're essentially part of a consciousness ecosystem, it's right. probably a very good idea for us not to want to isolate ourselves and isolate our own progress, but realize that we actually have a responsibility of also contributing and helping others as Absolutely. Well. That's the lady that I talked to at the end. That was one of her problems. She had isolated herself. People tend to do that and they make the mistake as they, as you grow up, you become different than other people who aren't as grown up. And if you let that slip into ego to where you feel better than them, well, then you start growing down. That's a, that's a de-evolutionary thing. Rain. So, you know, that's not a good, that's not a good thing. You have to not do that. You have to grow up and realize that you, you are somewhat isolated in your own mind because you see people, you see your family hurting each other and whatever, and you're not in that space anymore, but you know that they are. Okay. Well, you don't remove yourself from them. You don't isolate yourself. You still, that, that arguing, miserable family, that self-destructive, that dysfunctional family you see you came out of, it's not that you disown them. It's that you need to interact with them, but you need to do it in a positive way. You don't need to lecture them. You don't need to tell them anything. You need to give them hugs. You need to love them. You need not to argue with them, not try to change them unless they're ready for change. You just give them positive stuff. It probably won't change them very much, but that's all you can do. Just be positive with them. We need to be connected. That's where our challenges come from. It's our relationships. That's where the rubber meets the road for most of us. There isn't, and this is true for almost everyone, is that the person who challenges you most, the person, <coughs> the person that <coughs> can get your ego in an uproar quicker than anybody, <laughs> is the person that you're closest to. That's usually your husband or your wife, boyfriend or girlfriend. That's the person that can push your buttons. <coughs> then you should consider that person your best teacher. They are your teacher. And they reach out and shove one of your buttons and it upsets you. Well, that's your choice to be upset. Why did you make that choice? Because you have fear. Find that fear and try to work on getting rid of it. Okay, so that's those people who can push our buttons are our best teachers. We need to learn from them. Trying to isolate yourself from them 
is to take yourself away from your best teachers. So even your family that's dysfunctional can be a good teacher. It'll teach you how to give compassion to people just because you love them, whether you ever get anything back or not is irrelevant because most likely you're not going to get anything back. You know, people all have a different capacity to love. If your fear is big, your capacity to love is small. Your capacity to love is inverse to your, to your fear. So people who are very fearful have a smaller capacity to give, to love, because it's mostly about them. That's what fear is. Fear is always about you. So people who are fearful, even if they're right up to their capacity, loving just as much as they can, that may be very limited. Well, you have to realize they're doing the best they can with what they've got. All right, so it's very limited, but that's all they can do. So you have compassion for them, and give them a hug, and don't expect that they will one day be nice to you. They may never be nice to you, but that's all right. But it can be a growth opportunity for you then. You're right. When you're dealing with people that are very difficult, if you can get to the point where you can actually interact with them essentially with love and not let their negativity mm -hmm. bring you down, um, then maybe that is one of those accelerated learning opportunities. Exactly. So your best teachers are the ones that cause you the most pain for the most part because you need to transcend that pain. Now, you know, it depends, you know, there's, there's limits to everything, of course. You know, if you're in an abusive situation, then you probably should get out of it. But if you're just in a situation that's challenging, you should embrace it. So you know, we don't have one-size-fits-all rules. Rules have to adjust to the individual in a, in a situation. But generally, those people who really can hurt you the most and infuriate you the most, and make you angry and upset and sullen and those are the people who are close to you. Those are the people you you need to make your teacher. And realize it is your lesson. And when you get upset, you failed your lesson. So how do you know when to stay and when to leave? Um, <clears throat> because um, I had that situation in, in my life recently and, and because it, for example, you said to Tim, uh, if that group of friends is laughing about you because you made a mistake, then it's probably time to look for other friends who are better. Right. And you also said, like, if you're surrounded by low entropy people, it's easier for people that have high entropy mm -hmm. to, to grow up faster. So that sounds like, well, try to be in a crowd of people who are more evolved than, rather than, than less, less evolved. But on the other hand, you just said like it's, it's a growth opportunity to deal with people that are uh, on a higher entry. So how, how, how do I know when, when it still makes sense to take it as a challenge? And how do I know that, okay... Mm -hmm. Time to quit. Yeah. yeah. Potential. You have to make an assessment of the potential of that relationship. So you look at that relationship and say, does it have potential? Could this relationship get better? Could this relationship evolve into you know, a good relationship? Or could it evolve even if it stays the same? Can I evolve in this relationship and get better? Can I continue to grow with this great teacher I've got, you know, even if that teacher doesn't grow at all? What's the potential here? Potential for you, potential for others. And if you look at it and you say, yeah, this situation still has potential, well, it's probably worth sticking with it. If you look at it and say, there is no potential. In this relationship, I'm not going to grow. They're not going to grow. It just doesn't have the potential, or that potential is very small for turning into something better, and it's time to walk away. That's the difference. Now, there's no potential meter for you to do that. You'll just have to think about it. Think about, where is this going? Where could it go? How much could I learn from this person? Learn how to deal with that meanness maybe or whatever. Could I do that and really transcend that? Well, that would be good. I'd learn a lot. But maybe I can't. Maybe that's too big a step for me. Maybe that's just too far to go. I need to, and I need a shorter step to take. That's likely to fail because I'm not ready yet for that challenge. 
So then you look at it and say, well, the potential just isn't there for me, but what about the potential for her or him or whatever? Who else ever is involved in it? You look at the whole thing, and if you say, well, no, nah, it's probably not good for anybody. There's just not much potential here. The best thing to do is leave, then it's time to go. Find something that has more potential. And that assessment has to come out of you thinking about it. Where can you go? What can you do? How can you interact? How's it going to affect everybody else? How it's affecting your life and so on? And then you come to a conclusion. If there is potential there, work on it. That's how you learn. If there isn't much, or it's very unlikely, you know, what's the probability that this could end good? And that's the probability that this won't. If the probability is much greater that it won't, then there's very little potential. It's time to walk out. But if you can stick around, torture yourself, and <coughs> power through it, even if there's no potential on the other side, mm -hmm. you might be able to use that as a supercharged <laughs> growth opportunity. Exactly. Exactly. And you may grow more in a year than you would have grown in a lifetime just because you took a challenge that was difficult and you met it. I have a thing I do with people who, who uh, couples, when they talk about relationship. And I give, well, the, the guys mostly, but the guys and the ladies a challenge. And if you have a relationship, uh, in our culture, almost everybody's culture, but particularly Western culture, people don't tend to fall in love, they tend to fall in need. People have needs, and they have relationships to meet those needs. I'll meet your needs if you meet my needs is the deal. And if they agree that they're going to meet each other's needs, then they get married and become a couple, or they just live together and become a couple. Yeah. And that's the way we make relationships. It's not really, it doesn't have a lot to do with love. Mostly it has to do with self and need. But those relationships change and needs change. And when they change, then they tend to come unglued because basically it wasn't love, it was a deal. It's a business arrangement, kind of a, a verbal contract. I'll meet your needs if you meet my needs. Well, I don't feel like my needs are being met. I'm dissatisfied with the deal. Uh, you know, I'm done with the deal, I'll go elsewhere. See if I can somebody else meet my needs better. That's kind of the way we are. But if you turn it into love instead of a deal, a business arrangement, the potential goes, you know, skyrockets. That's a situation where one, part, one person in the couple focuses entirely on making the other person happy. That's their job. Just make them happy. It's not about themselves. It's about making that person happy. What can I do to make that person happy? And the other person does the same thing. What can they do you know, to make you happy? And if you have two people who just care about each other more than themselves, You've got a relationship that is magnificent. It's just so supportive, it's so perfect, because they actually love each other. It's about other, not about themselves. And love creates the most dynamic, the strongest, the best, the most supportive relationship possible. And I challenge some couples who ask me about relationship, and I, I usually start with the guys, but it can work either way. And I say, guys, what you need to do is you need to make your woman happy. And, of course, if it's a homosexual relation, then guys, what you need to do is make your guy happy. But the model's the same, so I just use it on a, on a, on a more average case. And what that means is if you disagree, she's right. If there's a problem, it's your problem to solve, not hers. Okay, so if there's some problem or disagreement, she says, I want to paint the walls purple. And you say, well, I just painted them a year ago. 
and I like the off-white a lot better than purple. Well, she wants some purple, paint them purple. Make her happy. It's not about the cost of the paint, it's about making her happy. See, it's not about whether you like purple or not, she does. So you do that, and her job is just to be honest, just to tell you how she feels, honestly. What really does she need to make her happy? And if you do that, there's a high probability that in time, she will want to make you happy because she's so pleased with the relationship that she doesn't want to lose you or wants you to find something else she wants to keep you because you are the perfect guy. So then she starts to just want to make you happy and you end up with a relationship based on love. But you got to start it someplace. Somebody has to start it. It can do that. You can start the opposite way as well. Female can start the process just as well. It's a little different, although it's not as a symmetric, um, uh, it's not entirely symmetric, but it can work both ways. And I've said that probably a dozen times and things, and I've had feedback now from probably 30 or 40 different couples who have, who have tried that. And it takes time, but for the most part, Matter of fact, all of them have said that it has changed their relationship tremendously. It really works very well. But it's a challenge to, for the guys because you're going to have to first act like you don't have any ego. And then you're going to have to actually not have any ego. Because if all you're doing is acting, that won't work. That will eventually fall through and you'll become yourself again. You can't act forever. So it's not that you just have to act that way, you have to be that way to where she is important. The most important thing, make her happy. So that is a hard thing to do, but the couples who've had the courage to do it find it very you know, uh, fulfilling. They get into a much, much better relationship because it's not longer and no longer about them. If it's about you, you're always frustrated and you're never happy. Because it's this idea, well, I want everything that I want. Well, as soon as you get everything you want, you want more. You want something else because that other stuff you wanted now is mundane. You know, the, you want this and the end of the want, you never get to the end of the want. If it's always about you, the only place you get to the end is if you're just giving to somebody. Okay. Now, of course, the ladies could take advantage of that. Oh, you'll do anything I want? Well, go stand on your head in the corner. I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> okay. But as they do that, then they are losing potential. The relationship potential starts to decrease and decrease. And if it gets to the point that the relationship potential is zero, then it's time for to break up. It's time to leave. So if she wants to have a potential to that relationship, then she needs to not act like that. She needs to do better. So it's, a, it's just an experiment to, uh, to do. So that's, you know, that's, that is the way things work. The more you care about other people, the more it comes back to you. When you do things for the right reason, it tends to work out. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. And, and um, do you think it depends on the other person if there are um, uh, similar interests or something like that, or is it possible with every person in a relationship? If there's if there's potential in a relationship. You know, then it can work that way. Yeah, any kind of relationship will work. You know, and the thing is, you can't do it with acting. You really have to be. So let's say that other person does doesn't have things that much in common. With you. You know, they like to go sailing, and you really are afraid of water. Yeah. You don't like to get on a boat. But they like to go sailing yeah. all the time. So, what you can do to make them happy, you can. Encourage them, okay, go sailing, 
If you want to go sailing today, that's fine. I'll be waiting for you when you come back. Okay. So that would be the thing that you would do rather than sailing. You're going to go sailing again today? You just went sailing last week. What did you... What, what do you have a relationship with that boat? Do you like that boat better than me? You know, you could get into this kind of thing, and that's just negativity, and that pulls everything down. That makes it go the wrong way. Yes. So making them happy would be, you know, sure, go ahead, I'll be here. And once he has a woman who is so agreeable and and uh, makes his life happy, he's going to think. Do I really want to go sailing? I think I'd rather, I think I'd rather stay home. Home is a really nice place. It's friendly, it's nice, it's supportive, and wow, I got a really great wife, so I don't think I'll go sailing today, honey. I think I'm gonna stay home with you. Let's paint the bedroom purple. You know? it's, see, it changes things. It changes things. Where if you're the other way, sailing, sailing again. Then he says, yeah, I really need to go sailing. You know, I just, I need some air. I'm cooped up in here. And he'll find all kinds of reasons why he really needs to get out of the house. So it, doing things the wrong way pushes things worse, which is why wrongness always collapses on itself. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse until it falls apart. So doing things the right way tends to fix those, the problems. They tend to fix themselves. So it's a... It's a positive thing. So even if it's if there's incompatibilities and other things, they can all be overcome by love. Love fixes all sorts of things. And it works both ways. But I always start with the guys leading <laughs> because there's a reason for that. The if the ladies lead, it'll probably take a little longer. <laughs> the reason it takes a little longer, and I had one lady who, who was the leader in it, and she wrote and said that, uh, that it was working out terrifically, that the husband was really, uh, you know, their relationship had changed a lot and they were a lot closer and so on. She said, but it took about two years before it started to turn around. <laughs> That's a pretty long time, two years. It could take, no, less time than that. It just depends on the people involved in it. But the reason is that it's better for the guys to lead is that guys deal in the outside world. Their world that they are equipped to interact with is the outside world. That's what they do. They interact, they deal with that outside world. Females tend to deal with the inside world. The inside world being the world of relationship. They deal in relationships and connections with people and the networking and that's natural to them and women do their inside work with their intellects men do their outside work with their intellects men stumble more or less blindly through relationships and women stumble around a bit in the outside world dealing with things. They don't want the detail on the outside worlds. Don't tell me how the com internal combustion engine works. Tell me where I have to put the key and what makes it go and what makes it stop. Don't tell me any more than that. They're not really that interested in how the outside world and how it works and all the details and so on. But they'll go into infinite detail about relationship and who said what and why and what does that mean and the feelings and that sort of thing. So it's just the difference between males and females. We kind of have mastery in one of those areas and we kind of fumble around in the other of those areas a lot. So because women are kind of the masters of relationship, they pay attention to relationship and those things. Nothing escapes them. They, they, they find, you know, meaning and significance in, in everything. So for the guy to start off, and he actually becomes low entropy, becomes love and makes her happy, she'll pick up on that very quickly and want to feed that, want to continue that, want to be worthy of that. You see, 
So that'll happen quickly because relationships is their thing. They won't take them two years before they figure that one out, they figure that out very fast. Whereas guys, relationships is not their thing. And if the lady just makes them happy, they'll have a tendency just to sit back and say, oh, life is good. Let the good times roll, okay. Thanks, honey. Oh, could you bring me a ham sandwich <laughs> while I watch the football game? You know, they're not as tuned into relationships, so they're going to be a little slower at picking that up. But eventually, they'll still pick it up, and they'll realize that their woman is so much better than anybody else's. Because they talk to all their friends and everything else, and they realize that they got it really, really good, and they feel like they need to change to earn that, to be worthy of it too. And they start changing and taking more interest in her and her happiness and that sort of thing. So they get there, but it takes them a longer time because that's not the place that they, that they really are, are that good at relationships. Yeah. Can I continue? Yeah, just continue. <laughs> so um, I understand the difference between um, men and women. Um, and um, that um, seems familiar to me. Um, but I, I talk a lot with friends about this topic, that um, men and women become more equal because um, women have another... Um, they develop in another way in, in our Western culture. And um, maybe men and women are not so different as we think, or um, my question is, will there be a change? Um, will, will men always be so um, focused on the outside and women on the inside? Uh, or will that be the, the main no. topic? And has, has it to be like that? To no, there, like will, that? there will definitely be change. Evolution requires yeah. that there's always change. Mm -hmm. And what happened, <coughs> what has happened in the gender world is that the environment has changed dramatically. So you have, we've had, you know, in this 200,000 years of humans walking around on the planet, almost all of them, except for the last few hundred, have been very hard, very dangerous places. And humanoids succeeded you know, it's not that we battled Neanderthals into the ground and killed them all because whatever. We outbred them. We we're more, um, we're better at procreation. We're better at uh, getting children raised into adulthood to where they can also procreate. And the reason that we're better is because we discovered that when you specialize, you can do things more efficiently and better. So just like Henry Ford decided at the assembly line where everybody was specialized, they could make a car in a tenth the time than if every one person makes a car himself. It just goes a lot faster because you can get really good at what you do when you do that thing. So we specialized and the females became smaller. They eat less food, they were to have babies and take care of them. Because that's what makes the species survive, is more babies that live. The men became the protectors and the providers. And they were to keep the women and the children safe so that the women could continue to have babies and the babies would continue to grow up to be adults that have babies. That's what makes your species survive. So because we, were, because we did that, women specialized in raising children, having and raising children. They grew up with the, with the instincts, if you will, that make them very good at that. Men grew up with the instincts of protecting and providing, and they got instincts that made them very good at that. And the ladies, it was a very dangerous place, and the women couldn't just get out and walk around and go shopping, you know, to the next cave, you know, down to the cave mall or something. <laughs> they, you know, if they got out and walked around, they were, they were very likely to be kidnapped, to be drug off someplace. Because women were valuable, very valuable. 
The reason they were valuable is because they had babies. Men, not so much. Men were expendable. They were to protect and provide, and if that didn't work out and they died instead, well, some other guy would just take that place. It wasn't that big a deal. Men are expendable, women were irreplaceable. So because of that, the group, the tribe, let's say, we'll just call them tribes if that's the group, the tribe was vulnerable if it was small to a bigger tribe. So if you're a small tribe and a bigger tribe comes and you've got nice stuff, like a nice cushy cave with a little spring in the back that's handy, well, this bigger tribe will just get rid of you. Right? They'll just overrun you, take your cave, take your food, take whatever it is you've got, because they're bigger and they can do it. That was the kind of environment. And what they would do is kill all the men who were past puberty, take all the women as their own. They wouldn't take the women as slaves, they were just women. They were now part of this other tribe because these women could have more babies, the tribe would get bigger, it would be more powerful, it would be less likely to be taken over by a bigger tribe, so power was in size of numbers. The more numbers you had, the more likely you were to survive. So women were very valuable. Women were often uh, would run through several husbands. And if that woman's husband died, well, there was somebody else that would take care of her and her children, whether it was her husband's brother or her you know, sister, somebody would take care of that. So in any case, that's kind of the environment we grew up in. The women need to be protected. They couldn't just walk around on their own or they'd end up in some other tribe. So that is our instincts. We've got these instincts inside of us like any other animal has instincts. Humans have instincts and our instincts obviously wrap around two things. And those are the things that are our criteria for evolving here. And that is the ability to survive and the ability to procreate. And that's where our instincts are. So we have females who are very good at raising children. Females much more easily can parallel process. It's not a problem. You know, you walk into an office and there'll be a secretary in there and she'll have a phone, talking on the phone. She'll be talking to you, standing in the window. You know, as this person pauses, she'll say something to you or hand you the papers and the pen that you need to fill out. And, you know, she hangs up that phone, you know, she should be typing and talking to you. Or a mother, you know, and she's, raised, she's got five kids and she's raising children and she can deal with all five of those, mm -hmm. keep the house clean and, you know, cook the meal and do all of that all at once. Whereas men don't parallel process very well because that's not our world. We deal with something and when we're done with that, we deal with the next thing. We have priority what we deal with, but we're more one track. A woman is a multi-track because you can't raise children if you're not multi-tracked. So we just are different in how we approach the world, but that different came from that, not 200,000 years, but 195,000 years <laughs> that we were in that mode of survival. And we still have these instincts and they're very strong. And the thing is, if you get too crosswise with your instincts, if you don't do what your instincts are telling you, you will feel unfulfilled. You will feel wrong. You will feel unhappy. So you kind of have to work with those instincts, otherwise you're not fulfilled. You feel like you're doing it wrong. So we have those, but our environment's changed. Women can get out of the cave now. They can walk, take the bus down to the mall. They can do all these things. Whereas before, it wasn't like that. That was impossible. So now, with a new environment, evolution has to take a turn has to optimize for the new environment. So yes, there's changes have to come. It can't be like that forever. On the other hand, instincts that have developed for 195,000 years don't turn on a dime. But they can change. But they're not going to change real quickly. Our environment has changed overnight, a few hundred years. You see, so this We've got some issues here that need to be worked out.
So yes, it's good now that we live in a kinder, gentler place. So much kinder and so much gentler that the females can finally get out of the cave and do something else. Well, that's great because there's just all that much more what productivity, possibility. You know, that, that's good. But we still have to deal with these instincts. We have to arrange our life in a modern world, but we still have to not get crossways with our instincts. You have to do both of those. And that's our challenge, you see, to do both of those at the same time. Eventually those instincts will change because they'll no longer be necessary for survival and procreation. And if they're not necessary for it, then they will tend to, you know, to go away. But they're not going to go away soon. So women still have to do those things that make them feel like women. The instinctual things. Otherwise they won't be happy with themselves. They'll feel something's missing in my life. And men still have to do those things that make them feel like men, or something will be missing in their life. And at the same time, everybody needs the freedom and the support and the encouragement to make as much of themselves as they can, to do what, you know, to fulfill their own passion and do what they do. So it's not by chance that, you know, more females go into nursing than males, because those those nurturing talents are talents that are part of the female instincts. So they like that kind of work. It suits them. It feels right to them. For men, it doesn't, isn't as good a fit. But that doesn't mean that men can't do that well. They can. Just like it doesn't mean that women don't make good engineers. They can. But it's not as comfortable for the average that so we have these instincts, and we have male and female, and it's this big probability curve. And most of the people are under the fat part of the curve. But there's this other part of the curve out here, it's not very pro probable, so you've got this long tail of the curve, and that on this end, say, is more masculine traits, and that on this end is more feminine traits. Most of the women are here in the middle, but some of them are way out there at you know, 10 sigma, it's a math term that means very improbable, way out on the end of the tail. And some are way out on the tail the other way. And then you have the masculine curve that sits right next to it. And some of them are way out on that masculine end, and some of them are not. Some of them have a lot of feminine traits. And that's all okay, because we need diversity. Diversity is a wonderful thing. It gives us all more opportunities to grow with diversity. But you have the fat part of the curve. So I'm mostly talking about this fat part of the curve. When I talk about men and women, I'm not talking about the tail ends. I'm talking just about the fat part of the curve. So the environment change, then attitudes change, and the very last thing to change is instincts. So for those under the fat part of the curve, they need to, to fulfill their instinctual patterns where they'll feel wrong, unfulfilled, not doing it right. And they also need, like I say, to fulfill themselves in a new environment. So that's why we have this problems going on now. It's, it's, it's kind of an unstable area in transition from one space to another space. But I think the solution isn't going to be to change our instincts. That's just a hard thing to do. It's not going to happen quickly. The best thing for us to do is to allow all the freedoms that we have to be who and what we want to be, to accept all the diversity, and to meet the needs of our instincts and also meet the needs of the new environment. They're not incompatible. They are compatible. They're just different, and we have to adjust to that, that difference. So that's, to answer your question, yeah, there, are, there is changes coming, and the changes are going to keep coming. We've, gotta turn that, we've been turning that corner for probably the last 200 years or 300 years, but it's a slow, a slow turn, yes.
What about the knowledge of people, more and more people that we incarnated both in female sure. and male bodies? So, sure. so we know both sides. Um, we, we, I think yeah, we do. this knowledge uh, uh, levels a lot of those things out. Yeah, it helps us understand each other. Mm -hmm. But when we're here, we don't really remember the past too well. Mm -hmm. So when we're here, we kind of get into the cultural norms, you know, the belief systems. Those are belief systems. So a, a culture is basically made up of a lot of belief systems. You pick up your cultural belief systems and cultural norms, and that's the way we, that's the stuff we take on. That's a persona we take on. Mm -hmm. But that may or may not resonate with us. That may or may not be something that we even like. Mm -hmm. But yes, you, you incarnate as male and female, rich and poor, black and white and red and everything. Because you learn more that way with diversity is, is a great teacher. It's, my, it's a difference. If I meet somebody in the street and I immediately I know, uh, okay, he's this 374th incarnation and he is <laughs> 200 male and 100 <laughs> female and he's rich for me. I look at him and I see, ah, namaste, I see you. <laughs> and he looks at me and says, okay, I see you. I mean, it's a totally different encounter if we grow up to this yeah. Uh, yeah. stage. Mm -hmm. And as we, as we grow up and become love, and our relationships are about making each other happy, it doesn't matter, does it? You see, if, what, if, if my whole goal in life is to make you happy, well, whether you're this way or that way is irrelevant. Whatever makes you happy, dear, you see. So it doesn't matter exactly how you are. And if you just want to make me happy, it doesn't matter that much exactly how I am. You can deal with whoever I am. So you see, once it becomes love, then these differences are not all that important anymore. The differences are very important when it's all about me. You're not meeting my needs. I'm not happy. I need somebody that does this, 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 and that, and has these attitudes, and you don't have those attitudes, and I'm unhappy. See, so as long as I'm ungrown and I have a low quality of consciousness, all these differences are big and important, and it's a big deal we have to overcome and whatever. But once we become love, it really doesn't matter anyway. So one of the solutions to this transition is just becoming love. That fixes the transition all by itself. It doesn't matter then. If, we, you know, if we're all trying to make each other happy, problem solved. So you see, all the problems we have, I mean, you, we can slice and dice the problems, say, well, these problems have instincts conflicting with the culture and so on and that, but the real problem is low quality consciousness. That's the big Thing that's the problem. Everything else is really symptoms of a problem. So, in the process of becoming love <clears throat> and evolving into that, when you run into those situations where you feel as though um, you you don't have it. In a, in a specific situation from the being level, but you want to have it, it seems that you can let things play out over time and eventually it'll get there as you evolve or go over multiple lifetimes. Or is there a method, I mean, are there any practical tips or measures to essentially intentionally self-modify, yeah. attempt to self-modify the code of our consciousness, for lack yeah, of a better term, absolutely. to adjust that. The magic word is intentionally. To intentionally do it, that's what does it, is intention. If you have a strong intent, you know, I don't want to be that way. I want to be this way. I don't want it to be all about me. I want to care about others. That's what's important to me. And then when you find yourself doing things that are all about you, you go, oh, really don't want to be that. I want to make other people more important. I don't want to, you know, complain about them because they're not doing what I want. Oh, that's not a good idea. Let me back off from that and see it from a different perspective. If you have the intent to change, that will make change happen all by itself. That modifies the future probability 
of you being changed. Can, can you give a, <coughs> a better definition of the intent and essentially um, also confirm if this is basically a method or a way to essentially self-program yes. ourselves at the being level? Yes, that's what it is. It's a way of, of changing yourself. Programming and reprogramming yourself at the being level is just your intent. You will become what you intend to be. It's the same intent that you use when you heal. Now, when you heal, you have to have an intent to heal. You can't just be going la, 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 la with your mind. You have to be focused. You have to have an intent. That changes things. The same thing. An intent to grow up will change the future probability that you're going to be growing up. It'll actually, you'll just grow up because you have this intention. But if it's an intellectual intention, oh, I'd really like to be grown up. I'll throw a penny in the wishing well and wish that I was grown up. That isn't going to work. It has to be the same kind of level intention that remote views, that heals, that does all these things. That's the intention that will help you grow up. So yes, and it reprograms, it makes you different. Can, can you distinguish the intellectual intent from the being level intent as far as the explanation? of the two, the contrasts, the differences between the two, and how to distinguish one from the other just to make sure that one is actually applying the, the, uh, the uh, being level intent versus the logical intent? Yeah, it's, you probably heard me say a lot of this when you were in the intensive because we talk about that a whole lot. But the being level intent is a is a, uh, you know, we talked about it being uh, in the zone. We talk about it not being, you know, not something you think about, it's something you are. Uh, we talk about it being intuitive. It's the intuitive side of you, not the intellectual side of you. So it's all the same thing that we've talked about before, is that intention has to be at the core, the being level. You have to really want it, and you have to have some energy in that intent. It can't just be an idle intent. It has to be something I really want to do enough that I pay attention to it, and I catch myself not doing it. I notice, and when I notice, I have a strong intention to be different. And if you really want to be that way, you will be that way. That intent changes everything. People who have uh, smoked, for years and years and years and they want to stop smoking. And they have withdrawals. Or whether it's heroin or whether it's sugar or whatever it is, it works. Withdrawals will work in the same way. If you want to smoke, I mean want to quit smoking, and the reason you want to quit is because you think you should. Well, it's not so healthy and everybody around me thinks I smell bad. I should probably quit. You will have terrible withdrawals because you're quitting because you think you should. It's an intellectual act. If you get down at your being level and you say, I don't want to smoke anymore. It's just a dumb thing to do. I don't want to do it. I'm a drug addict. I want it because I want it. I just don't want to be a drug addict anymore. I don't want to stink anymore. You know, I don't want to have to go outside you know, because I'm a drug addict. I reject it. I don't want it. I don't want to be that way. You will find that you can walk away from cigarettes and never have any withdrawals at all. Just walk away and you don't have any of that agonizing, oh, I just had a cup of coffee and I need a cigarette. It won't be that way. You'll walk away from it, it's gone. I can confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I add to that? Because I'm, I'm curious, for example, if you're a drug addict, um, and, and I worked um, as part of a civil service in a clinic dealing with drug addicts. So, so I learned that some of them, or the majority of them, needs like six or seven um, kind of like total going through the withdrawal and then the therapy process. And still they would get like dependent on the drug again and then they have to come back. So after six or seven times, like over 10 years or so, they would manage to get free from it. So um, if there were like a shortcut, like for example, um, shamanic ayahuasca ceremony or anything, mm -hmm. and they would only need one of those to get drug free. Would that be the same um, kind of like achievement level, the same amount of entropy reduction overtaking the shortcut kind of like um, make yeah. a difference? There is a shortcut, but the shortcut won't come from a drug. The shortcut will come from them being committed to it because they want to do it. Mm -hmm. 
But if they have a drug addiction, let's say they you know, have an alcoholic addiction, and their wife and their children really want them to clean up their act because it, you know, or their boss or other people are pushing them to clean it up, and they realize, they say, yeah, I'm an, I'm an alcoholic, I, have a, you know, I don't work as well at work, and I really should stop this. That's when it takes time after time after time because they're not really committed to not being alcoholics. They're just, at the intellectual level, they see that it's a bad idea and it's ruining their relationships and other things, so they want to stop it. But they're not really committed to not being an alcoholic. There's a difference between doing it because you think you should, doing it because other people want you to, doing it because you have to, because otherwise your boss is going to fire you and your wife is going to leave you. All of those reasons will make you quit, but you will rescind, you'll come back, you'll struggle, you'll have withdrawals. When you say, I don't want to be that anymore, and you really mean it, and you keep that in focus, keep that in your intent, it's at your being level, it'll change and you'll be done with it. And your withdrawals will be zero to minimal. You just walk away from it. Because your intent modifies your biochemistry. Your intent modifies your brain. Your, that intent changes future, future probability, and your system will rearrange itself to suit that future probability. So you're not just, it's not just that you're, you're, you're working up huge willpower. I mean, that's part of it, but you're really changing things. Your brain chemistry changes, your, a lot of things change. All those things that changed when you got to be an alcoholic, it went from normal to some dysfunctional state. That stuff can be changed much more quickly with intent. So you get physical changes, attitudinal changes, all of that goes. And instead of the body craving the nicotine or craving it, well, it stops craving it. Because that craving is a biological function. Certain parts of the biology have gotten used to that drug and now they want it. Well, biology changes more quickly. So the shortcut is through a focused intent, but you can't force anybody to do that. You could counsel them maybe and work with them to where they use that, and if you did, you'd probably have a, a lot more success. I mean, my, my knowledge is probably old because it was like back in the early 90s, but the theory back then was like most people or many people have to hit rock bottom to come to that point where they say like, I really want to change from, from their core, and not right. because my family wants, because they kind of like, they, they literally say like, you have to wake up in the street from, from like, kind of like overdosing or anything to realize that it's not the life you want to lead, so to make the change so that the next therapy is then the effective one. Yeah, if it wouldn't happen, yeah, that's true. If you get there, then that may help you get down to that core level intent. So that may be a thing that helps you get there. But you can get down to that core level intent, and say, okay, this is just horrible, I've been to the bottom, I've lived in the, under the bridge, I don't want this life anymore, I need to quit. And still, you quit for six months, and then that, that drive and that focus goes away. It's not there anymore. It was only in there when you could feel that pain, and all that pain, all right, that gave you, that gave you the oomph you needed to do it, so you do it, but now you're feeling better, and the boss isn't threatening you anymore, and the wife and kids are happier. So, well, a little, a little drink won't hurt. You know, you go back to that. And it's not so much that you, you know, that your, your withdrawal symptoms finally got the best of you, it's that you lost your focus. You lost your drive and your intention. Now your intention isn't like that. Now you're back to the, well, you know, I shouldn't, I really shouldn't do this, but you're starting making excuses and, and justifying what you're doing. Well, just one little drink won't hurt, and so on. You've lost the, you've lost that. So it wasn't a real, it wasn't a real thing. It was a temporary thing. So you have to, if you really want to not be that way, it's not temporary. It's a, it's a thing that you want to change and be different. It's not that you just want to change until you feel better. And now that you feel better, you can kind of go back to the way things were. But, but if you get to the same point of insight through, for example, a shamanic ceremony, mm -hmm. and it would be lasting, you, would, you wouldn't touch any drugs or alcohol or whatever from that point on in your life, would that be the same kind of effectiveness? Or did you kind of like still no. a little bit cheap if you system? Could, because if you could get that out of something, out of some counseling or 
shamanic thing or anything else, then it would be just as effective and last just as long. It wouldn't be a like a lighter stroke because it was shorter. Okay. It would be just as good as as the as the long method, probably even better than the long method. But you can't give that to somebody. No, they, have they, to have to course, yeah. they have to want it. They have to want it. So there isn't a shaman or a drug that's going to, to do it. But if there was one, yes, that would be not only would it be quicker, it would probably be better and more permanent than any other way. Because once you realize, you know, it's like being, you talk about being kind, you know, I mean, once you're kind, it's not like, well, okay, I've, I've been kind for a while, but that's eh, a lot of trouble being kind. I don't think I will. That's something that's in the intellect. When you really are that way, you just are that way. You don't. So it's not something you think about, it's R. You don't change that. It's not the temporary thing. If it's temporary, you're not really at that point. You're just so desperate that you feel you need to change, so you stop drinking for a while or whatever, but you're not really committed to being different. That commitment makes all the difference in the world. So you walked away from smoking, did you? Yeah. Yeah. I was smoking for like eight, nine years from 17 to 26 or whatever, and everybody told me, my mother, my, my father, my, but my mother, it's not good for you, I don't know what, and the other, anyway, and I <laughs> was not uh, <laughs> indulging them not to smoke anymore, but I knew I will could quit at some point, and one morning I was, I haven't uh, had any cigarettes, Oh, and I said, this is the very best time for me to quit, and I never do smoking. From that to morning, never again. Yeah, and it can, it can be very quick. Yeah. You can come to that decision just like that. Just like that. It, it was never with the uh, uh, headaches or something like you yeah. hear about. Uh, it, I had any, I had none of the symptoms. I was just, I quit and yeah. that was it. Yeah. It doesn't take long to make up your mind, but when you make up your mind, yeah. And if it's really, you want to change who you are, then the change happens. Yeah. And that was a heavy smoke, like more than one packet a day. And so I, 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 it was not light for me, so to say, I'm in normal conditions. But I said, no more edge. No. Yeah. So it's very powerful. This intent is a very powerful thing. Yeah. It can change a lot, and change a lot very quickly and permanently. That's why the best way to get rid of your fear is to really intend to deal with it and not have it. I really don't want to be that way. I don't want to react out of my feeling of inadequacy so I bully people around because I feel inadequate. And I'm afraid if I just tried to act nice with them, they'd reject me. So I avoid that rejection by, you know, being obnoxious. Of course they reject me. It's because I'm obnoxious not because I'm unworthy. See, it's different. So if you say, I really want to get rid of that, I don't want to react that way, that will do it faster than anything. Because that's why you do catch yourself. So you catch yourself acting that way and then you stop it. If you're not really committed, you never catch yourself until afterwards. All right, yeah, I feel like there's people around and, you know, have all kind of bluster and stuff. Gee, I shouldn't have done it that way. Well, that's all coming out of the intellect. You'll still do it that way tomorrow and the next day. It's that, in, that strong intent not to do it is what snags you right when it starts. So that intention is a very powerful thing. But isn't that uh, uh, tightly enough um, uh, tight with the logical approach? I mean, you verbalize your intent in some way, but if that should be a, 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 a equality between intent, uh, so the being level and the verbalizing level, I and mean, when you say, so when you do not mean it, I do not want to smoke anymore, it, you know you do not, you not, do not mean it or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't get it, why it should be a difference when you really mean it? And the way you say it, and uh, well, the verbalizing, I mean, well, it's you not know the, you, you don't, you, you lie to yourself, you know that. It's not just the saying it, it's the, it's the having the commitment to make the change. That's the thing at the being level. It's not, 
the, often the intellect leads to where you want to go. The, in, the intellect is good for direction. The being level just is. The intellect can, can uh, point direction. So the intellect can say, I really don't want to be that way, and that may be intellectual, but if that's only going to be intellectual, then that's not going to change much. You has to be down to the point that it's a strong intention to change. So but, yeah, but, but this is what I'm saying. When you just say it for like saying it, you do not mean it, but you know that it deep down. I mean, you, you have to change it. You have to change it deep down. You have to mean it. If you say it without meaning it, nothing happens. You have to really mean it. Otherwise, saying it isn't helpful. Yeah, but that's why I'm saying when, I mean, there isn't any difference when you actually intend it and you tell it that there is no lie. But when you, you just tell it for telling it, you know it's a lie. I mean, you know that this is my point. So why telling it? Yeah. yeah. What's the reason for telling it? <coughs> telling it to everyone else. Well, if you're not, if, when you know it's a lie, there's no point at all. Unless you're trying to impress people yeah, or makes your mother feel better. Who <laughs> say things and so, but they do not mean it. But they, all yeah. day long, they say things. Well, when they do that, what they're doing is tricking themselves. Yeah. They're making themselves feel better because they're thinking, you know, that uh, they're really doing the right thing or whatever. It's probably more to trick themselves to, than anybody else. But if they know that they're lying, then it's of no value whatsoever. There's no point in any of it. The intellect can direct someone toward growth, but you have to do the growth yourself at the being level. The intellect can't grow you up. Should we take a short break? 15 minutes, some fresh air, and some cake. Yes. <laughs>